Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Ask the Bug Nerds live stream here on YouTube. This is the Minnesota DNR coming at you today, and we have two entomologists with us. We have Val Cervenka, who is the DNR's forest entomologist, and we have Angie Amborn. She is the Department of Agriculture's entomologist. Welcome, ladies. Thanks for joining us. So Thanks. happy to be here. here. All right, so I'm gonna start us right off with some of the questions that we got prior to going live when we were just announcing that this was gonna happen because we know you two are very popular and people wanna start asking questions. First one is one that has been plaguing us all summer. I think I saw a murder hornet in my yard. Does the Department of Agriculture or the DNR wanna know about this? How do you respond? So Ange, should I go ahead and take this for the both of us? Yeah, go ahead. Well, it's probably not a murder hornet. And in that case, no, the agencies don't wanna know about it. The reason uh, I'm so convinced it's not a murder hornet, uh, they've only been found out in Washington state so far. They're very unlikely to be found here right now. Um, on the other hand, cicada killers, which is probably what was seen, are everywhere and they are active whenever cicadas are active. So July and August, and um, this year has been kind of a good year. I'm not sure whether it's because cicadas have been populous or a lot of cicada killers or are people just outside now looking at things. Um, nothing to be afraid of. They are not aggressive to humans or other animals. Um, they do kill cicadas, and that's what they use to feed their, their larvae with uh, in their underground burrows. So Angie, do you have anything to add here? I know that this has been the summer of people being concerned about murder hornets. So any, anything you want to add to what Val just said? So I, I would say that, I mean, we still want people to report them, even if it's not. I always say that a report that's negative um, is better. It's better that you report and it's not an invasive species than you don't report at all. So um, we would, you know, we would rather because I mean, it is possible that one might show up here somehow. And so if that were to happen, we would we would definitely want to know about it. I would add that the other thing that people might be seeing right now, um, cicada killers were really active July and August. But now some of the calls that we're getting have actually been our native horntail wasps. Um, sure. Now that they're out. Um, and so in the in the last few weeks, we've been getting some horn tails, but those are again are native. They're a wood boring wasp, but they're also very large and can sort of look menacing, but they're native and they're fine and they're not aggressive. They don't sting humans. And that's good to know, because in the end, I think that's what we're concerned about, right? The stinging potential of some of these insects. So sure. speaking of which, we just got a quest from jo uh, a question from Josie Thomason. Do bugs have spines? Do they? Sure. You mean like a <laughs> spine, like a spinal cord or like Pokemon? Oh. <laughs> she she didn't really elaborate. So I, think, I think you're going to need to uh, take it on the face of it. Do they have a spine? Anything that's like a spine? Well, sort of. I mean, they have a, it's called a ganglion, if you want to use <laughs> the term. They have like a very long, <laughs> right, Val? I mean, isn't that? Right. I'm well, but the of... other, the other thing though is they, they don't have internal skeletons. They have exoskeletons. And right. so, so they don't a have spine. a structure holding their body together from the inside. Exactly. But a lot of insects do have pointy spines that are sort of like hairs. Sometimes they're sensory. They have sensory um, jobs. Sometimes they're for uh, camouflage. Sometimes they're for defense. So there's those kinds of spines as well. So we got another question too, and this is insect related. I'm noticing some really large dead patches in my yard. What could be causing that? Insects? Do you want me to take that one, Val? Uh, go ahead. Go <laughs> ahead. Yes. One of you. First of all, I suppose your dog could be peeing. In <laughs> There's always that. I have those every year. Um, but if it's a Good big call. patch of grass where it is dead and the you can actually go and like pick the grass up and it just kind of rolls back, that could probably be caused by some kind of uh, 
turf feeding grub. And most likely that is going to be um, either a May and June beetle, um, a Japanese beetle, or we just recently found in Minnesota another invasive that's a turf pest called the European chafer beetle. Now, just because you have grubs doesn't necessarily mean you have European chafer beetles. Grubs are pretty hard to identify um, and they have fairly complex life cycles. Each one of those grubs has a different type of life cycle and kind of feeds at a different time of the year. Um, and some of them have one year life cycle, some of them have three year life cycles. So um, they're hard to identify. And so the best way to identify them is to probably have someone look at the grub. And in order to do that, you have to look at the configuration of the spines that we just talked about. And the spines are right next to their anus. And so it's pretty hard to, to see that if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, but it's probably some kind of grub digging in your grass, eating the roots. Who would you bring the grubs to to get them identified? <laughs> Well, I can do that. I will tell you that by the time people send me grubs, a lot of times they are super stinky. And I spend a lot of my time trying to hold my lunch in while I'm looking at them. Um, <laughs> but I can usually, if I get a grub that's in decent shape and I can look at, it's called the raster pattern. If I can look at that, then I can usually tell, you know, which species it is. So if you want to send them in, you can call the Department of Ag and we can send you out a collection kit. And then I, when I get it, I can take a look at it and tell you what it is. That's actually really cool. I didn't know you did that. That's, that's neat, Angie. So well, we're I getting... do it regularly. I just kind of started it this year. Thanks, <laughs> thanks to that friendly European chafer beetle that showed up. I have a hunch that you're getting, you're going to get some more grubs in the mail um, in the next few weeks <laughs> as a result of this. So we got a couple more questions in. Um, someone asked, what the heck is the insect that looks like a scorpion, only smaller in size? Oh, I can take that one, Angie. It's probably a pseudoscorpion. They're very tiny, but they uh, get in homes and what they feed on is things like uh, old wallpaper glue, book glue and things like that. I've never seen one in my home. It's been built 30 years ago. But those of you that live in older homes may find these commonly just anywhere. Um, they're probably similar in size to, let's just say wood tick, although there's no biting or stinging involved with these little guys. So they, they look like a scorpion, but they, they don't actually carry do. the same sting as a scorpion. They don't do, yes, they don't okay. have a sting at all. Yep, they're very benign. That's good to know. You yeah. think maybe it could be an, also maybe if it's a larger insect, do you think maybe people would mistake an earwig? Good question. With something that looks like a scorpion, that might be another one that people might. May, yeah, especially if you're outdoors. And it's got, because it has kind of those big pinchers on the end of its, that would be the only other thing that I think might, people might mistake for a scorpion. So, so we have two things to Google, you know, Google pseudoscorpion and earwig, and European earwig. earwig. You see the difference in pictures, what they look like. Yeah. So, all right, another another question. This is from Anthony. He says, hi, nerds. He's a photography nerd. And he wants to know where are good places to go and find insects and photograph them at this time of the year? Go well, ahead. so I can, yeah, I'll take this one. Um, you know, we're kind of losing places to go look because it's starting to get colder and less is in bloom. But really those flower gardens that have fall flowers are, a great place to look and especially I feel like anything with yellow flowers you're going to find some very cool things like ambush bugs um oh you might find blister beetles you might find soldier beetles longhorn beetles uh, you know of course butterflies feeding on on some of those flowers but goldenrod usually has a whole lot of different things um, but any blooming garden prairie that kind of thing. Like when you're out in the state parks, for example, um, trying to find leaf color, you can you can always find blooming flowers. So good. And so Ange, good if you've got something else to add, go ahead. <laughs> no, I said good plug for the state parks. Right. I mean, I have to. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so Anthony, head to a state park, look for flowers. You'll find some cool insects. That sound about right? Yep. All right. 
So then we got a, a question here from Laura. What does a woolly bear caterpillar turn into? My kids love finding those things. What does it become? Do you want it, Ange? Sure. Woolly bears are, they become what are called tiger moths. Um, and tiger moths are, that's, I mean, this is, this is the time of the year when um, the woolly bears are out. Um, tiger moths are really kind of pretty, typically showy moths. A lot of times they'll have orange and white on the wings. Um, Bower's a good place to where do you typically see tiger moths? I, I don't often see them in the city. I don't see the adults hardly ever. Um, it's the caterpillars that I see. And they're just randomly anywhere. Right. I have seen tiger moths um, when I've been out camping, the adults, around like the outhouse lights and stuff. Oh, but sure. Not, I, I don't often see them <laughs> in the city. There you go. When you go to the state park, hang around the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> you might actually find an earwig there too. <laughs> you never know. You never know what you're going to find. <laughs> All right. Another question. Um, how many locations have you found lily leaf beetle and chafer beetles? Uh, so... There is a, if I don't actually know the number off the top of my head, the European chafer beetle, I can tell you, it's only been three places, uh, two confirmed places in the Metro and then a confirmed place out in Holly, Minnesota, which is near Moorhead. The lily leaf beetle, there's quite a few, maybe 15 to 20 different spots. And if you want to see those spots, you can go to uh, Edmaps, which is capital E D D. S and then, or capital E D D, capital M A P S. If you Google Ed Maps, you can search for certain invasive species by state and a map will come up. And that's what we use at the state to keep track of invasive species. Um, so when someone comes in and sends us a, a request or a a submission and I confirm it, then I usually enter it into Ed Maps. And sometimes, um, reports come in through EdMaps. You can also use EdMaps to report invasive species. And so that's a really good way to, um, to re actually you can report anything, can't you Val, invasive with EdMaps. You can report yeah. plants, aquatics, um, animals, snails, uh, weeds. So that's a great uh, app to have and a great resource for people to report invasive species through. Well, that's good to know. Angie, so, I, I want to ask you, excuse me, Kim, can yeah. I just ask Angie, like, would you prefer that to arrest the pest? Um, well, so the nice thing about EdMaps, I mean, as the verifier, yes, I would, um, because EdMaps kind of forces you to take a picture and it automatically takes a GPS point. So all of the information that we really need is gathered by, by EdMaps. Um, there's an app that goes along with EdMaps called the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app, and you can get it for iOS or Android. And that when you use your phone to report, it automatically takes that GPS point. You can use your phone's camera and you upload it right there. And then if it's an insect, it comes to me. And then I go through the process of trying to verify it. And we have state verifiers set up for other things as well. There's someone specific for weeds or someone specific for aquatics. Um, and so at maps would be my preferred choice, but if you don't have that option, you can certainly use a rest the pest. So, so Oh, sorry. Back no, to the go ahead. beetle. There's kind of just three spots. There's a bunch of locations in St. Paul, Red Wing, and Fridley. Excellent. So this this question is probably a little less technical. What is the smartest bug? What is smart? Right. You're <laughs> <laughs> asking this is a. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you want to talk about organized behavior and that is being kind of smart, yep. I mean, then you talk about the social insects, ants, bees, honeybees, um, and there's other social insects too. But if you think about some of the things that they, each of the different castes in those societies work, it's pretty amazing. We, we might think of it as smart. For them, it's instinctive. 
they're programmed to behave the way they do. So smart. Um, yeah, but they're pretty smart, I would guess. Angie, do you have anything to add on the smart bug? I would say that I would go with Val on that one. I feel like that's a pretty good answer to a really complex and hard question. <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting because I don't know that I've ever thought of a smart bug except for the bugs that, you know, try to thwart you in your home when you're trying to get them outside. So a ants and bees probably fit that bill quite well. You know, there's this, not to go off onto a bizarre tangent, but there's a tiny native wasp that lays an egg inside a fly pupa as it is developing. So uh, everybody knows what a maggot is probably. And when they're done with their feeding part of the life stage, they become a pupa. Well, there's this little parasitic wasp that lays her egg inside of that, but she's got to know when it stops being just mush in that pupa and when it starts to turn into a fly. So she's not just throwing her egg into the soup. She's actually laying her egg on top of the body of the developing fly inside that pupa. That is smart because she's got to do that within a 24 to 48 hour period after the maggot becomes a pupa. Pretty crazy. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Okay, so on the ant and social insect note, we have a question from Jennifer. She wants to know, she found a carpenter ant in her home. Does she need to be worried that her house is rotting? Do you want me to go with that, Ange, or? I would say no. <laughs> yeah, correct. Unless you find that carpenter ant in February. And why is that, Val? want to worry about it. It, it, well, so so if they're active in, in February, they're obviously not going to be active outside. They're going to be active in your house. Why? Why are, why are they active? And especially if you're seeing more than one on a regular basis, there's probably a nest somewhere in a wall, somewhere close to rotting wood or wo water damaged wood. Um, and, you know, they're able to survive protected in there. But we all get ants in our homes all summer long all kinds of ants come and go they just get in yeah through a screen through your door um and that's nothing to worry about during the summer months so i know the two of you are entomologists and therefore love bugs although val i know you don't like spiders but you tell me all the time they're not an insect so <laughs> it's fine but but i know that probably folks watching this are wondering okay so when the ants come in what is the best or most effective way to get rid of them uh, as entomologists do you have a, a trick your shoe. <laughs> Kill them all. <laughs> I mean, if again, if it's in the winter, you know, get a few estimates from uh, from an extermination company, um, reliable company that says that they will come in and find the nest and get rid of the nest, which might mean taking apart a wall. Right. Uh, if, a, if a company says we're going to come in uh, every three months and spray your baseboards, you don't want to hire them because that, that's treating baseboards is not going to get rid of a colony. Every this spring, I get a small group of, I get these little tiny black and red ants in, my, in one spot in my house every spring. And I just vacuum them up. And then in about three, four weeks, they're all gone. But it happens every year. So they must get in somewhere, but I, I mean, so you can just do things like that. If it's not, you know, super bothersome to you, you can just vacuum them up and, you know, move on. If, if, if you don't, if you can get past the, the small ick factor. So you're saying that for most small infestations, you probably don't need to bring out a huge hammer. It should just be small things that you're doing to get rid of them, vacuuming, wiping, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that seems like the thing that I would do. I mean, but like Val says, if you're getting them repeatedly in the winter, then you're probably, you know, you probably have an issue. Right. Then you have a nest or something that needs professional assistance. That makes sense. It's great. So here's a, here's a kind of a fun question. Um, what is the rarest insect that you two have seen in nature? Hmm. Boy, well, stump the entomologist. Well, the, the, <laughs> I guess the rarest insect that 
I've seen would have been maybe some of the Carner blue butterflies when I was in college working um, with my professor on her Carner blue project. But I mean, that would probably be the most rare one. And there, there was also one time when I was doing some work with the Forest Service up in above the Arctic Circle when I lived in Alaska, there was a butterfly in the genus Parnassius, I think, which doesn't, and that it, it's a common genus in the Southern part or in the, the, the contiguous US, but they're not found. There's only a very small population found north of the Arctic Circle. And I happened to be on a hill and I saw those butterflies there. So that was pretty cool. That's awesome. Cool. So what about Lucky. you, Val? What's the rarest bug you've seen? I don't think I've seen anything rare. Uh, you know, we see a lot of things that other people don't notice. And so what's rare to somebody might not be rare to me, like those little wasps laying their eggs in fly pupae. Um, so yeah, no, I haven't seen anything that I think of as rare. Huh, that's interesting. I know you have a, a full array of insect, insects in pins in your office. So you have quite a few, I'm imagining, rare bugs there. But it's interesting. I would have assumed that you would have seen more rare things. And, and they're not so much either. I mean, if, you know, we're not taking rare things. I mean, right. I used to be a big collector, but nothing I collected in Minnesota was rare. Um, you really, those things you have to look hard for because right. they're not found statewide or outside of their little patch. So we have another question here. Why are so many bees around my hummingbird feeder right now? Any answer? I can take that one, Ange. Yeah, go um, ahead. <clears throat> well, they're not bees. They're wasps like yellow jackets, for example. Um, at this time of year, yellow jackets in particular are looking to stock up on their carbohydrates and proteins because they overwinter, the, the queens overwinter. Um, you see those big round uh, papery nests, or maybe it's just a little flat nest up under the eave. Um, the insects in there are not going to survive the winter. It's kind of an annual thing for them. So they will all die out except for the queen. So the queen is trying to get anything sweet, anything with carbohydrates. So that would be anything with a, you know, and your pop can or your hummingbird feeder, flowers. Um, and they, they also can eat meat. Um, so yeah, if you've got a sandwich outside, they actually could take a little nip of what was in your sandwich um, just to stock up on, on proteins and carbohydrates to overwinter. And then they'll start a new colony next year. Is there anything you can do to discourage them from gathering around the, the feeder? Take down the feeder. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, you were say that. honestly, you're going to have that right now. That's just kind of a fact. It, if you're outside, you're doing a picnic or anything, just be super careful when you take a drink of pop. Make sure you look in the can or you know, swish it around a little bit because you do not want to be stung on the lip. It's, yeah, that's painful. No. So another question, how big is Minnesota's biggest bug? Do you think it's a, I, I'm gonna say it's probably, I would go out on a limb and say it's either gonna be one of our darners. Oh yeah. Or one of those Prineid beetles, right? Oh, the longhorn beetle? The, the, yeah, the root feeder one. Yeah, could be. How about giant water bugs, though? Oh, yeah, giant. To yeah, giant water bugs get huge. That's, my, I mean, right? I mean, the giant water bug, a big darner is probably a big dragonfly. The darners are dragonflies. Might be about the same length, but that toe that toe biter is gonna certainly. And people outweigh. see those because they fly to lights, so people are sending pictures in what is this and yeah. and they are pretty big i would say they're at least two inches yeah, so, so bigger than that. you're calling this thing a toe biter does it actually bite your toe well yeah they they are actually an aquatic insect and they will actually uh if you're in the water they will bite i mean that people have been bitten by them and they will actually take down minnows 
but then they are attracted to life. So like Val says, so people often see them like by tennis courts and basketball courts and that kind of thing out at night. And so we're talking a two inch insect this big. Does it have pinchers or anything? How do we identify this thing? It does. It does. Kind of, yeah. The legs do look like pinchers. Yeah. And it's got, I mean, the legs do, but the, it, it's, it's mandibles are a pretty decent size. So if you get stung or bitten by one of these things, does anything happen or is it essentially harmless? No, it just, you okay. know, when you said that about the mandibles, that reminds me also of a Dobson fly, a male Dobson fly adult. Um, they do have these uh, mandibles. Actually, I don't know if they do anything with those mandibles. They look scary, um, but I don't think they could, could bite with those. Yeah. But we have had a couple of pictures of female Dobson flies that have a smaller mouth part, but they're long. They're also long, they long wings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we only have about three minutes left. So I'm going to ask what to me is always the fun question to ask you every year um, because it changes. Um, what is your favorite bug of the moment and why? Go, Ange. It's not the European <laughs> chafer beetle. <laughs> <laughs> or the fall web worm. Or the fall web worm, no. Um, so that is a good question. Um, I really, this summer, because I was home um, more, um, I really enjoyed, we have a gravel driveway um, where we keep our boat. And I was doing some of the Emerald Ash Borer biocontrol releases and I got to see a ton of tiger beetles this summer. Nice. So I, I mean, one day I came down a sidewalk and there must have been, they were just all over, there must have been a hundred of them. And I've just never, and they were all running, they were at the Dodge Nature Center, which is a great place to take pictures for of insects if anybody wants to know. Oh, the good Dodge to know. Nature Center in is it West St. Paul or South St. Paul? Um, is a or Mendota Heights? Yeah, it's a beautiful spot. Um, but there was tiger beetles everywhere. Tiger beetles were kind of my favorite of the summer. That's what about really you, Val? Cool. Gosh, I I just love cicadas. I just love the way they're shaped. I love the little waxy stuff they have on them. Um, I yeah, they've always been one of my top faves. So anything final before we leave that you want people to be on the lookout for as we head into fall, some cool bugs that they might want to see? Can I just say that that huge nest at the end of the branch is not a gypsy moth nest because gypsy moths don't make nests. It's fall webworm, native insect, looks ugly, but harmless. Good to know. Angie, what about you? Anything folks need to be on the lookout for or... No, I guess I would just say this is, I mean, as we're going into fall um, would be the time, you know, when the leaves start falling off is a good time to check your ash trees. Um, once, you know, it's hard to, sometimes hard to see emerald ash borer damage with the leaves still on the tree. So once the leaves fall off, um, you know, you can start looking for that flecking and that blonding on the trees for emerald ash borer. Awesome. Terrific. Well, both of you, I just want to thank both of you for joining us here on our Ask the Bug Nerds live stream here on YouTube. We will try to post this later on to Facebook so that folks can watch it. We have had Val Cervenka. She is the DNR's forest entomologist. And we've also had Angie Amborn. She is the Department of Agriculture's entomologist. Thank you, both of you. As always, this has been fun. Can't wait to do it again. All right. Thanks thank so much, Kim. Happy Labor Day. Bye-bye. Happy Labor Day to you all, too. Thank you.